Hello comrades and welcome to season 1 episode 9 of Spectre. Today I'm joined by a fellow comrade of mine, eh, Andrew Harris. Andy, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name's Andy Harris and I'm one of the founders of Fancy Port Food Bank Scotland as well as one of the organisers at the Celtic branch of FSF Scotland, known as Celt Supporting Food Banks. Good stuff. Uh, so just coming off on that point then, uh, Andrew, are you able to tell us more about uh, who are fans supporting food banks and what's some of the work that you guys do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Fan Supporting Food Banks was initially founded in Merseyside in 2015 by Bobby Daniels, Dave Kelly and Ian Byrne. Uh, it was founded as an organisation that had two simple aims. It was to support those in their community and their class who were struggling through football. Um, so Bobby and Ian are both Liverpool fans and Dave is an Everton fan. For those listening who aren't too familiar with um, football and football and rivalries, Liverpool and Everton are a fairly um, a, a fairly strong local rivalry in English football, and they came together to form the one organisation to support people in the city and, as I say, in their class who were struggling. Uh, but the overarching aim of the organisation is to see a universal right to food enshrined in law across the UK. Yeah, that's perfect, Comed. Uh... I as a uh, toffee myself, I know all about the rivalry. Uh, that's my English team. Uh, so it's great to see that uh, even down in England, the, the bridges are being built between uh, two clubs such as these. And, you know, fan supporting food banks you know, isn't just uh, centred around the, the clubs in England as well. We're also seeing a, a, a hive of activity here in Scotland. So I was just wondering uh, if you want to cover some of the stuff that's happened in Scotland and uh, all the activity that's happened so far. It's been really great to see. Uh, absolutely. So, as I say, it, it was founded in Merseyside and since then they've they've grown massively and organically as well, which is great to see. They've not been going and asking people or coercing folk to start things at their own clubs. It's been people going to them and asking how can we get involved. It's a great thing that's happening. We want to help out. Uh, so they've grown to, I think, they're at roughly 40 teams or just over that at the moment, and it crosses some of the biggest rival- rivalries in football across uh, these islands. The main hub for the group, as I say, is still Merseyside, but I think it's over a third of all uh, food bank donations come directly from them. It's like over a tonne of food every week or something absolutely ridiculous like that. But as you say, we have recently, we've got started in Scotland um, this year, um, basically, long story short, I happened to be at an event that Ian was speaking at in Glasgow in March, I believe it was. And having been an admirer for a long time of the work that Fan Sport and Food Banks were doing, I thought I'd take the chance, have a chat with them and see about potentially getting something started up here. Following on from that, I started asking around and found other people at different clubs who had the same interest in Fan Sport and Food Banks and were also wanting to make something happen. So... Myself, Neil Cowan, Marty Smith and Robert Foster got to work and Neil, who's a Partick Thistle fan, organised their branch called Jags for Good and they held their first collection like towards the end of April this year. Uh, we then we launched Fan Sport and Food Bank Scotland during the summer and had our first collection under that banner at a pre-season friendly between Celtic and Norwich, which uh, also saw a van load of friendly scousers coming up from the original branch to help us out. And we've we've no look back since. Uh, we started out with uh, between the four of us five clubs. So there was Neil at Partick Thistle, myself organising things at Celtic, um, Marty Smith organising things at both the and and the United, and Robert Foster organising it at Kilmarnock. Uh, and within weeks of that, we were up to six as a group of Rangers fans uh, organised by Ashley Baxter and Callum Murray got on board with us as well. Yeah, that's fantastic, Comrade. That's a, a really great insight. Uh, as someone who's uh, part of fan supporting food banks as well, as you mentioned, you know, that, that sort of solidarity that we get even from those in England coming up to Scotland with the van and, and everything is fantastic to see and uh, just sort of highlights the, the need for the work and the lengths people are, are willing to go to. And I suppose when we talk about the, the lengths that people are willing to go to and, you know, the fight for the, the right to food to be enshrined into law and the fact that, 
you know, there's a lot of clubs and fans establishing themselves uh, outside their stadiums. What are what are some of the obstacles that uh, fan initiatives face uh, in doing this? Especially, I imagine this might be quite useful for those perhaps uh, looking to start uh, a fan supporting food bank, uh, food bank chapter uh, at their own ground. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, as I say, it's been we've. We've, we've done some really good work since we've got started, but it's not been without its challenges. So a big one that we've had sort of more generally as an organisation has been the press and the coverage surrounding football fans as a whole, actually. Um, because as as you know, there's a, a massive tendency in the UK and particularly in Scotland for many in the media to almost look down on football fans and see us as irresponsible or violent and try and stoke division between different teams and different groups of supporters when in fact it's initiatives like fan support and food banks show that that's really not the case I guess it comes down to the fact that division sells papers and we saw that ahead of the Celtic Rangers game at Celtic Park uh, a few months ago so for those who aren't aware basically what happened was two days before the game we had entirely unfair claims being made by former politicians about how so-called football hooliganism was going to make a return and that that would be the way that football fans were going to respond to the cost of living crisis. We then, two days later, the Celtic group and the Rangers groups of fan support and food banks, we made history. We stood outside Celtic Park together, uh, bridging one of the fiercest, most historic divides in world football to collect for food banks supporting our communities in Glasgow. Uh, funnily enough, that didn't quite manage it onto the front page, but as I say, division sells. Yeah, it's fantastic comment. It was, uh, it's always the same story, isn't it, when it comes to uh, the media tackling working class people who try to organise themselves. They'll, they'll label them as thugs, criminals and everything else in between to, to suit their agenda. Uh, and not only not only those obstacles in, in terms of taking on the uh, various state sponsored uh, media outlets, uh, there's also a number of sort of uh, I guess you could say technical difficulties that can uh, occur with collecting uh, outside of stadiums. Uh, and I know that's something that self supporting food banks uh, has faced quite recently. Are you wanting to give a, a wee bit of insight to that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so just very quickly on the point about the press. I do, I do think it's it's only right that I reserve praise and convey thanks to a, a select few uh, people in the media who have actually been very supportive of us since we get started. So specifically, there's been John Brady from the Daily Record and Off the Ball uh, on BBC Radio Scotland. They've both given us great coverage and helped promote what we're trying to do. Off the Ball actually had Neil from the Party Thistle Group on very early on in the campaign to sort of promote what we're doing to a very large audience. And I think special thanks really need to go to Katrina Stewart at the Herald and Lewis McKenzie from STV, who've both really gone above and beyond what um, is expected of journalists in their ordinary jobs. So Katrina's done loads of bits and pieces for us. She's hosted a webinar that we organised for Challenge Poverty Week. Uh, and Lewis has actually, he's joined one of our branches to help with our collections and I hope I've not embarrassed either of them by that because they, they never ask for any praise or recognition or anything. But I think it's important that we do highlight that as much as there is an overarching, very unfair narrative about football fans and whatever we try and do in the media, that there are a select few trying to make a difference uh, to that. And I think we should support them. Um, but I think the fact that they've not asked for any recognition or praise or anything like that shows that they're, they are genuinely wanting to help out. Um, but going back to the thing that you said about the sort of logistical difficulties we've been having, I know that we at Self Support and Food Banks have had our fair share of issues surrounding this. You know, we've been uh, we've been collecting off the stadium footprint uh, on a pavement across the road from the stadium. Basically, you need permission to go onto any privately owned property and do this sort of thing, and we don't have that permission from the club. Um, so we've been trying to navigate between different bits of advice given to us by the police, by the council, all these sorts of things. It, it's, it has caused plenty of difficulties so far. We're in the process of getting in contact with all the different relevant parties, whether that is, as I say, the council, the police or the club itself, to try and get everything sorted. And we're really hopeful that we'll be able to do that over the course of the World Cup shutdown that's coming up. Um, to be fair, that's not been so much of an issue across the board, I find, because I'm doing the organising at Celtic, I come at it from 
it's almost a slightly different set of circumstances to what you see at most other clubs throughout the country just because of the sheer size and sort of geographical spread of our support compared to the vast majority of others. But um, what we have found generally is that, or what I should say as well, is if there's anybody that's looking to start, we'll obviously help you out with all these um, issues as well. But the amount of cooperation that takes place between an FSF group and a club in each instance can is it's a huge benefit. Um, like I think the Dundee teams in particular have been really good at it. Uh, Dundee actually they've put a table out at their training ground for the players to bring items in and donate, which has got a pretty strong amount of donations coming from that. And we even saw Gordon Strachan, who I believe is a technical director at Dundee. Uh, out chatting to the group up there before our recent game and getting his photo taken with our right to food banner and everything. Um, so it shows that there, there are plenty of people within the clubs that are you know wanting to help us out and wanting to make a difference. It's just trying to get that sort of happening across the board um, as a campaign. I guess the final barrier, um, as it where it comes down to really just getting the word out about who we are and what we're doing, what we're trying to do. Uh, as I say, I feel I feel almost bad. I'm I'm speaking from a perspective of the work being done at Celtic, which, as I mentioned, isn't quite the same circumstances as most other clubs. So they are all things that can be overcome with work and with dialogue and communication. And as I say, if anyone listening to this is interested in getting involved, either at a club that's already got a branch set up or is looking to get one set up themselves, we'll help you out with it every step of the way. Yeah, that's great, Colin. That's a, a good insight into some of the difficulties faced, uh, specifically those on, uh, you know, u- utilising the... Uh, footpath uh, at Celtic you know, it's, it's been an issue and one of the issues is obviously the, the communication even with the, the police uh, there, uh, it's, it's been an issue of police uh, providing mixed messages uh, stating that we'd be able to park up opposite the stadium with a permit but that permit can be revoked by uh, a match commander who then can revoke another decision by the traffic commander. So all these loopholes can pose various, various challenges. As you say, you know, people shouldn't be uh, put off by these, especially when fan support and food bank Scotland's got a really strong, strong body of uh, organisers there as well. And folk who uh, can share the expertise and the knowledge that's been learned by those down in England as well. I guess that sort of brings us on to the the next point then, and uh, it's the the whole focus of fan support and food banks in itself. Uh, it doesn't exist as a charity uh, organisation. It, it truly is a broad network of solidarity, and that's the the solidarity in the fight for the right to food to be enshrined into law. So, just looking to see if you can give uh, some folk who might be unsure of you know uh, what that is uh, and how uh, they can go about it. Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, we were, we're not a charity group. Uh, one of the slogans that we use more than anything else is solidarity, not charity, because that's what we're looking to build for. We're not wanting to just provide uh, this this food for food banks and for people who are struggling in our communities uh, and pretend that that is happening in a bubble. Uh, we have to acknowledge that it's part of a wider societal issue, which is that we're the sixth richest country in the world and there are people who are living in abject poverty, meaning that they, they don't have suitable housing, they don't have uh, food to eat, their kids are going to school hungry, uh, they're having to skip meals to provide food for their kids, all these different things all come into it. Uh, and that's a key reason why we believe that a broad campaign is needed to deal with not just food poverty, but poverty in general. That's why Fan Sport Food Banks is a part of the Enough is Enough campaign. And Ian Byrne, as I mentioned earlier, has, in particular, has done outstanding work for uh, not just for Enough is Enough, but specifically for the Right to Food campaign since being elected as an MP in 2019. Uh, so we think that a way that we can really help on the campaigning aspect of things is supporting him and supporting uh, the Enough is Enough campaign with their five key demands of a real pay rise for workers, uh, uh, cutting the extortionate energy bills we're seeing at the moment, decent housing for all, a fairer, more progressive system of taxation, and of course, a universal right to food. One thing that folk often get a bit confused about when we talk about a right to food is what it actually means in practice. Uh, and the truth is that it can take so many different forms. It's it's not a case of the, 
the government giving out free food to every home, as some people believe necessarily. It simply says that the government has to take responsibility for ensuring that the people of this country, as I say, the sixth richest country in the world, have enough to eat. It's a humanitarian mission in the fact that it's necessary is a scandal in itself, but we are wanting to fight it in any way we can. And as you mentioned, for those looking to get involved as individuals, there are three main ways that I would sort of suggest to get involved. The first of all, and the most simple of all of these, is to share our platform, amplify our platform on social media. We're, we're very active on Twitter, and that's where we get most of our information out to people about whether it's collections we're doing, things we're doing to get involved with the Right Food campaign, all these different things. Uh, Twitter's the main place for that. Uh, I, the next thing I would say is get in contact with your elected officials. Um, we've seen over 20 councils, I think it is at this point, across the UK committing to supporting our right to food. And that, as I say, um, we're not a party political organisation and that spans across various different um, party councils, if that makes sense. Um, and seeing that number increase can only be a good thing. I'd also suggest getting in touch with your MSPs if you're in Scotland and your MPs, wherever you are in the UK, uh, to confirm and lobby them to support our right to food as well. These are people who, who their jobs is their jobs are sorry to stand up for the interests of their constituents, and this is one of the clearest, most simple, most obvious ways that that can be done. If you want to stand up for the people you meant to represent, make sure they've got enough to eat. I'll, you know, a lot of politicians like to adopt a sort of progressive caring narrative when it suits them but then when it comes down to it they'll turn to the same tried, tested and failed policies that we've seen for decades uh, we as a campaign as an organisation we're vibrant we're forward thinking uh, and as I said we're on a humanitarian mission to support people in our communities who are quite literally starving. I think the, the thing that sums it up more than anything else uh, we had UNICEF uh, recently supporting food banks in the UK. You know, you think of UNICEF, you think of countries who don't have the resources to help their people out, who are sort of needing the support more than anyone. Uh, we're the sixth richest country in the world and UNICEF are in feeding our children because we couldn't do it ourselves. And if if they can't support a mission that tell uh, if our politicians, sorry, can't support a mission that uh, says we need to end that sort of support, we need to end the reliance on these food banks, on these charities, then that will tell you more about them than any soundbite or social media post ever will. Finally, there's just one one selfish one uh, from us about how you can get involved in the Right to Food campaign, and that is joining up with fan support and food banks. So um, if you're a football fan, then get in touch. It doesn't Getting in touch with us, finding out what we do isn't a commitment that you have to spend every waking moment slaving away for us. Um, find out what we're about, find out if there's something that you can do uh, that fits in with your life that will help our campaign, whether that's helping us with collections uh, or helping with the Right to Food campaign in your own time. Um, even if you're not necessarily a football fan, there could still be plenty of things that you can do either with us or in your own communities to help us push the campaign forward. Uh, I think an example of that would be, again, at, in the group itself that we've got a volunteer called Michael, who a great guy, by the way, uh, who he doesn't actually have a season ticket for Celtic, but he's been a huge help to us in carrying out or in helping us carry out collections and dropping food off at food banks um, when he's got the spare time to do it. So as I say, it just shows that we're, we can be flexible. For, we appreciate people are busy, but if you've got any time at all you can spare, please get in touch with us and consider uh, helping us out. I think the beauty of this campaign is, as I say, there's something that literally everyone can do to help. As I said, if you've got time to give, get in touch and we'll find something for you to do. Yeah, perfect, Andy. There's a, a lot to unpack there uh, to those listening. Yeah, as Andy says, you know, you don't need to be uh, slaving away, although we would very much appreciate it. <laughs> so if you're feeling <laughs> generous, go for it. But yeah, just going back to sort of the the right to food then and the, the sort of current situation we're in in, in Britain uh, with the fact that so many people are uh, now forced to rely on food banks. The, the number of this is continuously growing uh, and clear consistency with the uh, growing Tory austerity measures that have been implemented uh, over the years. It's a direct correlation. Uh, and we're seeing the, the effects in this, not just in uh, everyday 
people and their bills but even at the food banks where people can no longer afford to even donate uh, what they could before and we're seeing a, a shrink in donations and that leaves our, our most vulnerable and one of the most precarious situations possible where they're now truly truly forced between eating or heating their homes and it's a terrifying prospect when you think of how many people are, are, are parents and uh, making that choice for their children as well as Andy's mentioned uh, earlier in the show you know there's people skipping meals they're uh, making sure their children eat before them and still going to work and it's absolutely frightening but uh, yeah going going to the, the, the right of food and absolutely vital in the midst of this you know so-called cost of living crisis a crisis of pure greed of capitalism and decay unable to hold up its very foundations we're seeing that everyday people are having to donate more and more to food banks for for what they can to to make up some of the the slack that's that's created and the the emphasis really is now that uh, we have to donate because these are people that rely uh, on these services these are people who would quite frankly die without them as it's been said before, you know, it's this isn't a, a charity group. Fan supporting food banks don't want to become a charity group. They want people to be standing in solidarity to give them the power that they need to feed themselves uh, rather than having people rely solely on these donations when the when we're, we're seeing a, a number in donations uh, decrease uh, through the, the brutal recession that uh, could take place very, very soon. But yeah, that's a, a great insight, uh, Andy, and you sort of mentioned in the the slogan that's used uh, of solidarity not charity uh, and there's also the the other slogan uh, which we've talked about briefly before that is hunger doesn't wear club colors and you've highlighted previously the the success uh, of this slogan especially with the likes of liverpool and everton uh, and rangers Celtic. i'm just looking to see if you want to talk more on uh, sort of that success uh, with a slogan and, and and bridging some of the rivalries uh, and uh, perhaps some of the uh, successes that these fan initiatives have had in uh, establishing themselves within the actual framework of the clubs they support also? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, uh, a key slogan which is really fundamental to everything we do is that hunger doesn't wear club colours. And, you know, it it goes to show, as you mentioned, with the, the rivalries that have been broken down even if it's temporarily, um, to come together and support these initiatives. There is so much more that unites us um, than what divides us, whether you're a Celtic fan, a Rangers fan, a Liverpool fan, an Everton fan, a Man United fan, Man City fan. Any rivalry that you can think of between football clubs is absolutely nothing compared to the solidarity that we really have for each other when it comes down to it. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the collections in Liverpool or in Merseyside, I should say, the Everton, the Everton side don't like me calling it Liverpool so much. Um, but the collections that happen there, whether it's Everton are playing at home or Liverpool playing at home, it's about a ton of food that gets donated every week, and that's not a ton of food that the Everton fans make sure they're only donating to Everton fans or the Liverpool fans are making sure they're only donating to Liverpool fans. It's people donating to people who need it, and that. It's something that we're looking to expand on even further than we already have. Um, as as we both mentioned, um, we've done some good work on it so far, but I think we're able to do more and we're always looking to do more. We're always looking to grow and continue in the work that we've have been doing and we want to continue to do. And the thing is it doesn't even it doesn't just apply to uh, football clubs as well. You know, hunger doesn't have a gender, so the fight against hunger shouldn't either. It's not Catholic, it's not Protestant, Muslim, Hindu, Jewish, atheist. So neither is a fight against it. It doesn't have an age, it doesn't recognise borders, it doesn't have a sexual orientation, it doesn't even have one singular political party. Uh, and so the fight against it doesn't have any of those things either. But at the end of the day, it's about our class supporting our class, our communities supporting our communities, and that's all it essentially comes down to. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely spot on, comrade. As you said there, you know, doesn't wear co- colours of any form. Uh, the shocking, disgrace of, you know, implementing policy that puts people on the breadline is a pure moral choice uh, at the end of the day. And just going on to the end there, just to round up and, and finish off there, uh, Andrew, just looking to see if you get any uh, final talking points and uh, whereabouts can we find uh, fan supporting food banks uh, across social media and that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think in terms of a final talking point, it would just be reiterating that fact that we, we've we done some good work so far. We've been active uh, as Fan Support and Food Bank Scotland for 
I believe it's just under four months now, and we've done lots of good work already with a relatively small but committed group of volunteers. So if you're willing to expand the capacity of what we're able to do, uh, then get active, get organised with us, and join the fight for a right to food and an end to poverty. Because as, as I said before, ending food poverty uh, is not the answer. It's ending poverty in all its forms is the ultimate aim of this group. So in terms of getting in touch with us to get involved, uh, we're on both Twitter and Facebook as FSF Scotland. And we also have individual branch Twitter accounts. Uh, so if you're a Partick Thistle fan, you can go to at Jags for Good. If you're a Dundee or Dundee United fan, you can go to at Dundee FSF. If you're a Celtic fan, you can go to at Celts Food Banks. If you're a Rangers fan, you can go to at Jers Food Banks. And last but certainly not least, if you're a Kelly fan, you can go to at Kelly Food Banks. And we hope to expand that number of individual branch Twitter accounts as more and more people from more and more different clubs look to get involved. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear. Uh, comrade, and I'm sure the, the person who does the art for all this will be very, very busy uh, when all these clubs <laughs> get established. But yeah, no, that's that's perfect, Comrade. Uh, just want to thank you for your time for for coming on the show and giving your insight uh, into this, especially on the uh, right to food and the, the form that uh, that fight takes. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. I've really appreciated it. Thanks, comrades, for tuning in to another episode of Spectre. As discussed in the show, the fans supporting food banks and issue are grateful for the donations that you're giving them. They're also sickened at the fact that a need for food bank donations continues to grow each week. It's been noted in the British political climate that an unelected head of state has appointed two unelected prime ministers in the space of just a few weeks, showcasing to the world the absolute farce of Britain's so-called democracy. This is a democracy that has millions of working class people in fear. Fear that they won't be able to feed their children and fear that they'll freeze to death in their homes this winter. In Scotland, hundreds and thousands of these working class football fans are continuing to come together to watch their teams at the weekend to escape such fears. These same football fans, as we've discussed, are labelled hooligans, thugs and criminals by the media. Yet these are the fans that are coming to the collections, not only to donate, but to ask what they can do to put an end to food poverty in their communities. They're taking part in organising collections, communicating with their clubs and working alongside fans of other clubs, even their rivals. They're continuing to show and build the solidarity that is much needed in today's economic climate, a climate of capitalism and decay. The working class people of Scotland will continue to build and strengthen the solidarity that has grown over the last couple of years, especially through the Fan Support and Food Bank initiative. Tory austerity won't stop them from standing with their fellow workers and ensuring that these workers have enough food on their tables. SNP sabre rattling against trade unions won't stop them from supporting those taking industrial action against the private companies that continue to exploit them and force them to use food banks. And feudalistic inbred monarchs won't stop them or keep them down. The working class people of Scotland will continue to fight against those who live off the blood, sweat and tears of their labour, no matter if they call themselves king or queen. It's up to us together to stand united in the fight for not just a right to food, but to the emancipation of the proletariat as a whole. Thanks again, comrades, for tuning in to another episode of Spectre. Be sure to give fan support and food banks a follow and continue to retweet all their social media posts to get the information out there to as many people as possible. If you're looking to get involved, take note of what Andy said and contact fan support and food banks to see what they can do to assist you in setting up a chapter at your club. Be sure to leave us a review on Spotify or on any other platform that you're listening in on and be sure to share us on social media. Share us to your friends, family, co-workers and everyone else in between. A reminder as well, for those looking to get on the show, be sure to send us a message via the email that is linked in to the Spectre Podcast Twitter account. Remember comrades, we'll have to stand together in this fight, for we are the workers. We serve no king, no queen. We serve only the working class.